Unlimited of the Supreme Person. Of the Supreme Person. Da, 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 instrument. Atmanam, the material creation, Nilaya, by pastimes, Ashri Jat, created. Matraya said, eternal time is the primal source of the interactions of the three modes of material nature. It is unchangeable and limitless, and it works as the instrument of the Supreme Personality of Godhead for his pastimes in the material creation. <laughs> the impersonal time factor is the background of this material manifestation as the instrument of the Supreme Lord. It is the ingredient of assistance of to material nature. No one knows where time began, no one knows where it ends. And it is time only which can keep a record of the creation, maintenance and destruction of the material manifestation. This time factor is the material cause of creation and is therefore a self-expansion of the personality of Godhead. Time is considered the impersonal feature of the Lord. The time factor is also explained by modern men in various ways. Some accept it al almost as it is explained in the Shema Bhagavatam. For example, in Hebrew literature, time is accepted in the same spirit as a representation of God. It is stated therein, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Metaphysically, time is distinguished as absolute and real. Absolute time is continuous, is unaffected by the speed or slowness of material things. Time is astronomically and mathematically calculated in relation to the speed, change and life of a particular object. Factually, however, time has nothing to do with the relativities of things. Rather, everything is shaped and calculated in terms of the facility offered by time. Time is the basic measurement of the activity of our senses by which we calculate past, present and future. But in factual calculation, time has no beginning and no end. Pandit Jamaica says that even a slight fraction of time cannot be purchased with millions of dollars, and therefore even a moment of time lost without profit must be calculated as the greatest loss in life. Time is not subject to any form of psychology or nor are the moments objective realities in themselves, but they are dependent on particular experiences. Therefore, Srila Jiva Goswami concludes that the time factor is intermixed with the activities, actions and reactions of the external energy of the Lord. The external energy or material nature works under the superintendence of the time factor as the Lord himself. And that is why material nature appears to have produced so many wonderful things in the cosmic manifestation. Bhagavad Gita confirms this conclusion as follows. Maya Yakshina Prakriti Sukhite Sajjaratra Hitunna Nena Sukhya Jagat Vipari Vatati Yomadhyan Nandasya Janandhyana Slakaya Chakshana Nita Mena Tashna Shmi Kuravima Yes, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells us that he is time. He says of letters, I am the letter A. Amongst compound words, I am the dual compound. I am also inexhaustible time. 
and of creators. I am Brahma. Okay. Thanks, man. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah, so while Krishna was present on earth, approximately 5,000 years ago, he displayed his six opulences in full. Full strength, fame, beauty, knowledge, and renunciation. So in this Bhagavad Gita verse, Krishna is now instructing Arjuna, his confidential devotee and friend, special knowledge of his opulences and various manifestations, of which time is one. You know, no one is equal to Krishna, and no one is greater than him. He is the cause of all causes, the ultimate controller of all living entities. And the more we hear about him, his unlimited glories, the more deep one desires to surrender unto him and become fixed in his loving service. So Srila Prabhupada, he explains, you know, generally people, they know that God is great. They know that he's great, but they do not know in detail how he is great. So this particular knowledge of his many opulences, such as time, is required in order to increase our faith and realization of his greatness, his supreme position. You know, ultimately, he is the source of all spiritual material worlds. You know, everything emanates from him. Even down to the minutest detail of this finely tuned universe is being controlled and maintained by him. So those who understand and realize his supreme position, they surrender unto him and they put his, their lives in his hands. So here, this verse in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is declaring that he is this mystical force that is the background of this cosmic manifestation. That mystical force is time. And because the Lord has no beginning and he has no end, he is also known as eternal time, Kava. And just to get a hint of Krishna's unlimited time, we read in the Brahma Samhita. Uh, just to give a hint of Krishna's unlimited time, by the standard of the life of Lord Brahma, the Brahma Samhita tells us that the life of Lord Brahma, which is something like fantastic lifespan, 311 trillion, 40 billion years, is calculated to be less than one second of the Lord's time. <laughs> and of course the influence, influential stars and planets and luminaries in the sky and even the atoms all over the universe are rotating in their respective orbits under the direction of the Supreme Lord represented by eternal time. That's what we're reading in this verse. As it's mentioned here, no one knows where time began. No one knows where time ends. But in factual calculation, the Vedas tell us that time has no beginning, it has no end. You know, time is eternal. So in balancing our life, it's helpful to understand this dynamic force that sets material in motion this force of the time. You know, as I mentioned here, the time to us, time is the basic measurement by which we calculate past, present and future. We also speak of time in measurements such as, you know, seconds, minutes, hours, days, years. However, in our Vedic scriptures, we find that they speak only briefly of how time is measured. Instead, they refer time as a force of nature, a very commanding force, commanding influence that pushes us ever forward. Yes, so many things we see are being wonderfully orchestrated by the magic wand of the Supreme Lord. So this time has amazing and wonderful and you could say extraordinary potency. It's so powerful, this time. 
It reduces all matter to oblivion in due course. So in this sense, it is said that time is the destructive form of the Supreme Lord. And we can practically see by nature's law how time's mission is the destruction of all material things. How all material things are being destroyed right before our very eyes. You know, how our material bodies, you know, our house, our car, machinery, roads, software, clothes, musical instruments, I mean, you name it. Everything that practically exists in this material world, gradually it just grows old, it falls apart, it disintegrates in due course of time. But the amazing mystical thing is that we can perceive these long-term results of the aging process, we cannot actually see or actually experience the aging process as it's happening. Prabhupada gives the example just like our hair and our fingernails <laughs> growing. After some time you see the growth. But from moment to moment you cannot experience the growing. Simply everything in this creation gets old, gradually decays. And we can see the results after some time the deterioration and the aging, but as it's taking place, the process itself, we cannot see, it's imperceptible. Also, due to the influence of this powerful, deluding material energy, it seems that time is moving very, very slowly. However, the Vedas tell us that actually, in reality, time is moving very swiftly. It's moving very quickly. Sometimes time is called Chandra Vega. It means very swiftly passing away. In reality, our lifespan is just a flash in eternity. You know, I think 80 years is the... is the... Uh, generally people live to... at 80 years old in this modern day. In some countries it's less, some countries it's more, but... You know, you spend the first 20 years of your life growing up, getting your education. The last 20 years, you're winding down, getting older. So if you take off those 40 years, you're only left with 40 really good years. And you sleep half that. So you're only left with like 20 really good years. And if you, if you just remember how quickly the last 10 years went. It went really quickly, right? The time is just moving very quickly. It is said that just as a clock goes tick, 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 our breathing is going on a fixed time. It meaning, uh, means, according to our karma, we have a fixed and already a lot of lifespan, according to the so many millions of breaths and when we have exhausted these breaths, we pass on to the next life. All according to our calm, we're given a fixed lifespan. You know, sometimes, one example given, sometimes we see children on the seashore. You know, they're laboring hard to build these beautiful sand castles. But at the day's end, what happens? is the tide comes in and it washes all the castles away. Similarly, adults, they spend their lives building castles of worldly accomplishments in the sands of material existence. But at the dusk of life, what happens? The rising ocean of time will send the waves of death and wash everything away. In this way, Sometimes time is compared to the colour supper, the colour supper, or the cobra snake. When you get bitten by the cobra, practically speaking, no one can revive you or bring you back to life. The, the, the bite of the cobra is said to be lethal. <laughs> 
So no one can avoid the cruel hands of time. Ultimately, everyone, everyone, doesn't matter who they are, willingly or unwillingly must surrender to the Lord in the form of eternal time. And the Bhagavatam described this, you know, what do we surrender? We surrender our body, our land, our wealth, our family, our prestige, whatever we have produced with great labor for happiness. The Supreme Lord is a time factor which represents the inexplicable wish of the Lord, takes it all away at the time of death. Everything's taken away. We come to this world with nothing, we leave with nothing. And there's nothing to be lamented about. I mean, it's beyond human control. Yet everyone is afraid and is lamenting under the spell of Maya or illusion. Therefore, the Vedic texts, they warn us about how this insurmountable time can imperceptibly overcome us, causing us to lose perspective of the reality of life and make us imagine that we can remain in this body, in this world, and just go on enjoying forever. Now, generally, people, they don't like to talk about death and these other things, you know. <laughs> However, in our Vedic culture, we talk very openly about these realities of life. And we see that in the Bhagavatam, there's two types of katas going on. There's a Krishna kata, talks about Krishna and his pastimes, and there's also the material world kata. <laughs> about the, 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 the realities of life, of living in the material world. You know, sometimes we tell people, I know this, you know, amongst, especially amongst the Indian community, sometimes we tell people that, you know, that, you know in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna promises that if you just follow his instructions and practice this Krishna consciousness, he will take you back to his eternal abode at the end of your life, Goboka Vrindavan, where you can just be eternally happy. But in response, many people say, oh my, okay, why do I need to go to Krishna's abode? I'm happy here. I've got a nice house. I've got a nice family, a nice job. I've got a nice car, <laughs> nice friends, good food. I'm okay. Why do I need to go to Goloka? I'm, I'm good. <laughs> now, people have become so blinded by the dazzling glitter of material opulence and sense gratification. And you know, they're making so many plans for material happiness and enjoyment that they, be, they become blind to the passing of time. You know, some, many, some people generally, you know, they, they really like us Hare Krishnas. You know, we're good people, they think we're good people, they like our food. Many people like to, they like our chanting, chanting, and they appreciate our welfare activities, you know, trying to help people in the world. But they feel very uncomfortable with this idea that ancient scriptures can guide modern man. <laughs> yes. And this is because generally materialistic people, they're so... They're very proud of their advancement in education, their philosophical speculation, their so-called advancement in scientific knowledge and the so-called advancement of our materialistic civilization. Therefore, they question, you know, how is it possible that ancient scriptures, which were written thousands of years ago, can guide modern man? We've got to bring in the backup speaker. No, they'll take the power of the whole thing. Yeah. We got the backup speaker. Eight to five or something. Eight to three. No? Three o'clock. Three o'clock. Oh, three o'clock. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you already got his own power. Guys. Oh. Not good. Yeah, I'm going to keep you going. Come on. What do you think about the power?
<laughs> yeah. So people, they simply imagine. And they're so, so, so proud of their so-called advancement of modern materialistic civilization that they question, how is it possible these ancient scriptures can guide modern man? They simply imagine that within their tiny orbit of family and friends and their little material empire, they're protected from the cruel hands of death. You know, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, he tells a nice story in regards to this about a, a very wealthy frog. <laughs> it's a funny story. You know, this, there was this frog and he was hopping around his lake one fine day and by chance he found a 50 cent coin. And he, he, he was so happy, he was jumping up in the air. I'm rich, I'm rich, he shouted. He was so happy. What other frog in the world has as much money as me? So then one day he was sitting on his 50 cent coin, protecting it, and he was bloated with pride. He began to think, now that I've made it, now that I'm the richest frog in the world, let me do something for my fellow frogs. I'll be known as the greatest of all frogs. Actually, I'll become the king of frogs. Then he thought, what's the biggest problem facing my fellow frogs? Then he thought, it's those elephants. <laughs> when they come down to the lake to drink and bathe, this creates a great disturbance spell on my, for my fellow frogs. But now that I'm the richest frog in the world, I will not tolerate this anymore. Just then, at that moment, he noticed the king's elephant was coming down to the lake with his mahout, you know, the elephant controller. <laughs> Immediately, the frog called out, stop, don't come to this lake. It's me, the richest frog in the world. Don't dare come to this lake. You know, the elephant, he, he heard this little noise, but he, he didn't really pay much attention. Once again, he kept coming to the lake. Next minute, again, the frog called out, Stop! Stop! Elephant! Stop! Don't come to this lake! The elephant kept coming. Then suddenly, that little proud frog, he jumped from his 50-cent coin before the elephant attempting to stop him. <laughs> Unfortunately, that huge elephant's foot happened to step on that little frog. And he had to leave, this, the richest frog in the world had to leave his body. It's a sad ending to the story. <laughs> that Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, he tells a story that in his pride, the little frog, he lost perspective of the reality of life. Similarly, those people who are so proud of their material acquisitions and advancement of material civilization and scientific advancement, who do not even understand the, the, the divine purpose behind this beautiful creation and the purpose to the human form of life, they lose perspective of the reality of life. And imagine they can remain in this body and enjoy forever. Is that conversation between King Yudhisthira and Yamaraj. And was it Yamaraj was asking Yudhisthira, you know, what's the most amazing thing in this world? He said, the most amazing thing is that even though people are seeing, so many people are dying. You know, one sees his father died, his grandfather, his great-grandfather, his mother, he himself thinks that he's not going to die, that he's going to live on perpetually. Therefore, our bhakti scriptures advise us, you know, we have to wake up, realize the temporary nature of this world, and try to realize how valuable is this human form of life, which is meant for self-realization and preparing ourselves for the next life. 
As we're reading here, John Eka Pandit says, even a slight fraction of time cannot be purchased by millions of gold coins. Therefore, even a moment of lost time without profit can be calculated as the greatest loss in time, in life. It means that one has to utilize one's time in discovering the purpose, the vision, the plan of the Supreme Lord behind this wonderful creation and learn how to act in accordance to his cosmic plan. You know, it's a piece of paper. If I pick up a piece of paper, it has no real value. But when the government assigns certain value to the paper in the form of paper money, it has value and it's useful. Similarly, without understanding the purpose behind this wonderful creation and the purpose to this human form of life, our efforts in life may have very little value, very little meaning. So these Vedic scriptures, they give us directions, they give us hope, and also they give us warning that with every rising and setting of the sun, we are one day closer to death. And for most people, this means taking another birth in this material world among the 8,400,000 species of life and continue to suffer this birth, death, old age and disease. However, for those who spend their lives absorbed in loving devotional service to Krishna, every sunset brings them one day closer to their own eternal life where they can go back to the spiritual world. Actually, there's one verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam that compares time to a big wheel this gigantic wheel, which has 360 joints, six rims in the shape of seasons, and numberless leaves carved upon it in the shape of moments. And through its revolution, with great velocity, it cuts short the lifespan of this entire creation. However, it cannot touch the lifespan of the devotees of the Lord. Therefore, although everyone's afraid of death, no one knows what happens at the time of death. The devotees who know, they know that the time factor is simply a representative or a manifestation of the Supreme Lord. Therefore, they have no fear of the influence of time. For devotees in Krishna consciousness, us devotees, we learn how the material world is not our real home. We don't care about time. We don't, this is not our real home. Our real home is in the spiritual world, kingdom of God, Goloka Vrindavan, that beyond this present material body, we have an eternal spiritual identity. And when we finally achieve spiritual perfection in our spiritual consciousness, we can return to our real home in the spiritual world. We don't want to stay here. You know, once they ask Prabhupada, you know, that, that we hear about separation from the Lord is, is a very is, is a supreme devotional condition realized by those devotees who have the highest realizations but, but we should we also feel separation from the Lord even though we're not very advanced Prabhupada said yes that we should be thinking Krishna is so far away in the spiritual world and we're way way down here in this little planet earth this is just one tiny little planet and one corner of one tiny little universe within a cluster of billions of universes but we want to be with him 
We want to be with him. Therefore, we should feel that separation. Yeah, we've been wandering in this cycle of birth and death for countless lifetimes. And we get trapped in this cycle of birth and death due to our attachments to this material world. So this means that our desires, our attachments, our thoughts, our words, our deeds, they shape our consciousness throughout our life, including at the moment of death. Therefore, this consciousness we have developed throughout our life determines on where we'll take our next birth. Therefore, in Bhakti Yoga, we learn about the importance of you know, purifying and refining our consciousness, preparing ourselves for the best next life, going back to Godhead. This means that, you know, when the soul finally takes birth in a human form, it's very rare just to get a human form. It has an opportunity to just transcend this reincarnation cycle of birth and death and gain liberation ultimate freedom, eternal happiness. Therefore, it is said, you know, this Krishna consciousness, it's our greatest asset. You know, some people, you know, just to get a human form of life is very rare. When you think of all the different species of life and living entities out there, little insects and animals, 8 million, 400, thousand, eight million species of life. Just to get a human form of life, extremely rare. But to get this Krishna consciousness is, is so rare. It is so, so special. And even though people talk about their assets, you know, they've got their home and they've got their investments and they've got so much money in the bank and uh, for the devotee, our greatest, most valuable asset is our Krishna consciousness. And therefore, whatever adjustment we may need to make in our life, we have to protect and nurture this most valuable asset. Because we know that Maya, who is a representative of this, this powerful, deluding material energy, she's a very clever thief. She's going to try and steal it away from us. <laughs> and this can happen very easily. You know, um, and, it, and it can be, happen when people become a little lazy or lethargic and they're not doing their spiritual practices. Or sometimes people get proud and they start thinking that they're better than others, so they start seeing faults or committing offences to devotees, and this, can, this is how Maya can take us away from Krishna consciousness, steal away this most precious asset, and it happens. We see so many nice devotees have left this movement, you know, due to, you know, pride or lethargy, laziness. You know, it's just hard to imagine just waking up one fine day and, and you're not even a devotee anymore. But it happens. So this means that, you know, using our free will, we can choose either to take shelter of this illusory material energy and, and remain entrapped in material consciousness and be forced to take birth again in this material body, in a material body, or we can use our free will to take shelter of the divine spiritual energy of the Lord and purify and elevate our consciousness and gain liberation from this cycle of birth and death. And if we cultivate and perfect our loving relationship with Krishna, then at the time of death, we have nothing to fear. You know, we read about the horrendous things experienced by materialistic, you know, atheistic people. You know, the time of death, the Yamadudas come, they rip the soul from the body. You know, there's even 
stories and accounts of people, you know, in great fear, you know, things are, you know, and then they have to go down and be, they're punished and in different ways and then they're forced to take a birth, uh, not necessarily as a human being. I mean, Prabhupada said, generally most people in our modern world are, are on the royal road down to the animal kingdom. But for a devotee, it's not like that. You know, we can imagine, just like sometimes you just doze off in class. Does anyone ever do that? <laughs> so similarly, at the time of death, you simply doze off for a short time, then you wake up and you're in the most beautiful, amazing, transcendental place, Goloka Vrindavan with Krishna and his eternal associates, where you can live eternally with Krishna. It's hard to imagine. It almost sounds like a, a fairy tale or something that's, you know, far beyond what we can achieve. But Krishna promises, you know, if we just sincerely practice this process of Krishna consciousness, he'll take us there. Like a look of Vrindavan at the end of this life. And so we read about this Goloka Vrindavan uh, where Radha and Krishna are enjoying this continuous series of spiritually sweet pastimes that revolve one after another through the background of this transcendental time. You know, it is said in this Brahma Samhita that in the spiritual world, there is eternal, the eternal existence of transcendental time, which is ever-present, without past or future. Imagine living in a place where there's no past and there's no future. And it's, it's not subject to the quality of passing away even for the space of half a moment. It's inconceivable. You know, time like everything else in Goloka Vrindavan and serves Radha and Krishna in order to constantly increase their material enjoyment and pastimes and pleasure. You know, in the spiritual world, time acts differently to in the material, material world. You know, in the spiritual world, you know, spiritual time enhances and expands all activities. Whereas time in the material world, what it does, it acts to divide and diminish and ultimately destroy all material things, even all re material relationships that come to an end. I'll, I'll just finish it. But, um, I'll just uh, read this verse again. Hmm. Maitreya said, eternal time is the prime evil source of the interactions of the three modes of material nature. It is unchangeable and limitless and it works as the instrument of the Supreme Personality of Godhead for his pastimes in the material creation. Oh, does anyone have any questions you'd like to ask? Any questions? Yeah. Um, I have a question about the urgency. You talked about the, uh, the urgency in our relationship to our spiritual process. Of course, the time is passing very swiftly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, just as a little anecdote, we had an experiment with a devotee some years ago during a seminar where he had us chant two minutes of rounds thinking that we had one year left. Yeah. And after that, uh -huh. two minutes of chanting thinking that we had one month left. And then, you know, we added up, you know, one week left one day left, one hour left, and we ended up, you know, chanting 
tomatoes of, of Japan, huh? thinking that this was this would be the last one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we could see the quality increasing mm -hmm. because of the sense of urgency. Mm. But in my personal case, I find it very hard to find that, you know, urgency uh, in daily life. Could yeah, you have yeah. any insights, advice mm. uh, regarding that? Yeah, I mean, Prabhupada did say that, you know, every day when you wake up, you should be thinking, this could be my last day. Like, this is like, <laughs> that it's just, uh, it's a fact. I mean, uh, I know Mahatma Prabhu gave, he, in that seminar he gave, uh, he, he talks about that, uh, how, you know, if we, if, we, if we knew we only had a few days left to live, would we be ready? Are we ready to go back to Godhead? Or, or do we still have too many attachments here in this material world? Do we, do we think that, well, I'm not ready yet. Uh, I think I'll stay. Give me, give me another couple of years and maybe then I'll, uh, I'll be ready for it. <laughs> you know, like that. But it's a fact. I mean, it's, um, you know, the reality is that... Um, as Prabhupada said, that even on the royal road, uh, there's, there's accidents, you know, and it happens that sometimes you just don't know what, what's going to happen, you know, and, and we find that even amongst devotees, you know, suddenly a devotee realizes he's got this terrible cancer that's just taken over his whole body, and he's only got, you know, a month to live or two months to live. It could, it could happen to us. You know, someone finds they've got leukemia, you know, or, or, or some, or someone just uh, or, or has a heart attack, you know, and, and then suddenly it's uh, it's it's all over, and and, and and the reality of those things becomes more significant as you grow older. You know, when you when you get into your seventies and eighties and nineties, you realise that actually. Anything can happen, you know. I might, I might not even wake up tomorrow. <laughs> I might just pass in the night, you know. So therefore, yeah, when you're when you're younger, you know, you're thinking time is. I'm so young. I've got so many years to go, and you know, I don't need to. You know, there's a saying. You know, that one devotee used to say that Krishna's with his four arms. He's saying, "Come on, come on, come back, come back to Godhead." And we're saying, yeah, yeah, I'm coming, I'm coming. You know, I just, I'm just uh, taking my time. Yeah, you know, just like. Uh... So I mean, you know, we have to have incredible enthusiasm and determination in our spiritual practices, but also we have to have some patience. You know, patience has to be there because, you know, no one's becoming a pure devotee overnight. You know, it takes. It's a gradual process, and therefore. You know, our faith and our, you know, and our um, and our determination has to be accompanied by patience. And we have to have this. Uh, we have to. Ch we have to have a lot of willpower. You know. Actually, Radha Swami gives a nice story. He talks about this <laughs> in Arabia. There's this tree. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a, a, a national um, monument, you know. It, it's it called the, they call it the tree of life, and it's this tree, and it stands in the Arabian desert, and it's been standing there for four hundred years, and it's this beautiful tree with beautiful green leaves, and it's just flourishing. And no one knows how this tree survives. You know, there's many different theories and there's many, even scientists have tried to figure it out and no one knows for sure. It's, it's a national monument, you know, this tree of life. So he is as an example, just like this tree just survives and it's like, you know, the heat there is incredible, you know, just, the, the, some of the hottest places in the world, and sandstorms, 
the summit, no water. There's not one other tree for thousands of miles around this tree. <laughs> so meditating on that tree of life, we could tap into our willpower and think that even despite all difficulties and problems and obstacles and lack of motivation, if we just somehow or other show our sincerity to Krishna by just continually to practice this process of Krishna consciousness, <laughs> then we'll, we'll achieve the goal. We'll achieve the goal, you know. And it is also said, you know, that, you know, Krishna is so kind. If a devotee is very sincere, even though we may not be perfect at the time of death, Krishna will, he'll, he'll, he'll carry what we lack. He'll make up the difference. He'll make up the balance of what we're lacking. He'll take us back to, to his Goloka Vrindavan. Yes. So yes, it's, um, it's not always easy to have that, you know, sheer determination and this and that, you know, and this, but uh, we have to, uh, we have to make the effort. And the more Krishna sees us wanting to take shelter of him, the more he will help us, you know, and give us inspiration and help and support. But he'll only help us to the degree we're willing to take shelter. So it's, it's, it's kind of encompassing this mood of helplessness. You know, helplessness, we find that in the writings of the Acharyas, in their songs, in their writings. It's this a feeling of total helplessness, dependence on the mercy of the Lord and the Holy Name. So we have to develop, we also have to develop that, you know, that when we're chanting, you know, is that, that, that we, we're not just chanting mechanically or robotically, or we're chanting inattentively, but we're really making an effort to chant, hearing the holy name. You're calling out to Krishna, please help me, please accept me, please let me serve you. Please let me help you. It has to be in that mood. Just like the example I gave uh, a while ago, is that one devotee gave that example, that just like a child, you know, sometimes when a child's sitting in his little, his little high chair, you know, the high chair where he eats his lunch, <laughs> and sometimes the children, they just cry because they want attention. The mother knows her cry. And sometimes she just doesn't pay much attention, you know. She knows he just wants attention. But if the, if the child falls out of the cart on the floor, hits his head, then starts crying, the mother knows that cry, right? She comes. So suddenly when Krishna, when we chant with that mood, really calling out for Krishna's mercy, Krishna, it, it moves Krishna's heart. Krishna takes notice. He's forced to take notice of us. And he can intervene, you know, he can... Otherwise, if we're just chanting mechanically, robotically, inattentively, you know, Krishna may not pay so much attention, you know. It's like, it's actually a little bit offensive, you know, that you know, we're chanting, Krishna's come in the form of his name, and we're just kind of ignoring him, you know. Is that okay? Is that... Thank you very much. Jai Shri Prabhupada Ki, Shri Bhagavatam Ki, Go Prima Nanda.